Hello, and welcome to the first in the Archaeological Society of Connecticut and the Friends of the Office of State Archaeology's Spring Lecture Series. Please be sure to tune in over the next four weeks as we have a great slate of speakers tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce Alec Weitzel, a PhD student at the University of Connecticut Anthropology Department. He is a human ecologist, anthropologist, and archaeologist who is interested in studying humans and their environmental and social contexts. Ellick has published articles in American Antiquity, Nature Communications, Environmental Archaeology, and Southeastern Archaeology, among, among other journals. Tonight, Ellick will be discussing the ecological consequences of European colonization in southern New England. As with our previous lectures, please hold your questions until the end, and then you can ask your questions via the Q&A feature. If you would like to ask your question in person, please use the raise your hand feature, and I can activate your microphone. But please be aware that if I do activate your microphone, we will hear everything that's on your computer uh, and you will be recorded. So uh, with that, please join me in welcoming Alec and I will uh, take my picture off of here. Thank you, Alec. All right, thank you very much, Dave. Um, appreciate the introduction. And yeah, as Dave said, I'm gonna be talking to you guys tonight about the ecological consequences of European colonization in Southern New England. Um, however, this is a vast topic with a huge literature associated with it. And so I'm really focused in on just um, uh, a very small subset of this broader conversation. Um, most of the things that I'm going to be talking with you about uh, are really kind of the, the very late pre-colonial environment of southern New England and the very early colonial environment in the 17th century. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff that we could talk about, but um, time is... Uh, limiting factor here. And so to start off with a, a cliche from Southern New England, I'm going to begin with the first Thanksgiving. Um, it's relevance to this conversation is more in some of the, the early descriptions of what's going on at the Plymouth Colony and kind of the reasons behind what is kind of uh, viewed as the first Thanksgiving there in uh, 1621. And if you look at Winslow's account of this event that we now consider to be the first Thanksgiving, um, he describes the sort of environmental and ecological uh, and resource abundance that the pilgrims experienced um, in their first kind of uh, year uh, of the Plymouth Colony. And reading what Winslow um, was writing about here, we can see um, that he wrote that our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling. Uh, they four in one day killed as much fowl as with a little help beside, served the company almost a week. All right, so four guys went out, killed enough birds that they could have fed the whole group for a week. That's a huge number of birds if you think about it. Um, Winslow goes on to describe how when Massasoit, um, uh, the sachem showed up with 90 men um, where they hung out with them with the, the pilgrims for three days. Uh, Massasoit sent out a couple of guys and they went out and they killed five deer, which they brought back to the plantation. Um, being able to go out and just kill five deer and bring them back is probably indicative of some sort of abundance of that um, species in the area. And this account from Winslow, I mean, this is... Um, one of many accounts from all across North and South America in the early years of European colonization that describe um, this phenomenon of ecological abundance. Um, there's legitimate questions to be had about whether this is an accurate representation of what's going on or not, but there's some other evidence that suggests that it might be. And this is kind of the crux of what I'm gonna be talking to you about, um, why we're perceiving such um, ecological abundance or certain ecological changes in the early years of European colonization. Um, the questions are really, I mean, was this abundance, assuming that it's real, was this typical? Is this just how Southern New England's environment was uh, in the 1620s? Um, is this unusual for some reason? Is there some particular uh, environmental factor that's leading to this perception of abundance? Uh, is this a recent development, perhaps? Were things not always as abundant, but now they are? Are things changing because of the arrival of European settlers? Um, there's a lot of questions to be asked here. And really, I think that there's kind of uh, three possible explanations that I'm going to consider in this talk. Uh, the first of these would be that this is just natural abundance. This is the way the environment is. Um, being kind of um, 
in the early years of colonization, uh, before European settlers have really moved in and modified the landscape to a great extent, perhaps things were just very abundant in the early 17th century. That's one possible explanation. Um, a second possible explanation is indigenous ecosystem engineering. This idea that native peoples right, had been living here in Southern New England as elsewhere in the Western hemisphere for thousands of years. Uh, and they were almost certainly modifying their environment to a great degree. And so it's possible that this uh, in abundance of fowl, of deer, of whatever else it may be in these early descriptions, this abundance may be due to modification of the environment by native peoples. Um, that is another explanation. Uh, a third explanation um, sort of related to this is that of environmental rebound, which I'll talk a bit more about in a second. Um, the idea being that before European colonization, uh, native peoples impacted the environment um, in sometimes negative ways, overexploiting resources or at least reducing the abundance of certain resources. And then in the early years of colonization, following kind of mass depopulation of native peoples due to epidemics and warfare and genocide and all of this kind of colonial package, um, the environment then rebounded as that kind of human pressure on resources was potentially alleviated. Uh, these are the three explanations that I'm going to evaluate here. And they really do require us to not only understand what's going on in the early colonial period, but also to understand what was going on in the last decades, the last centuries, perhaps even the last millennia of pre-colonial times before Europeans uh, showed up in southern New England. Um, and so thinking about what was going on before Europeans arrived in the Western Hemisphere, um, the best place to start really is a really famous paper by William Denovan from 92 on the pristine myth. Uh, and the pristine myth is this idea that was really common for uh, hundreds of years, um, dating back to the, the years in which kind of colonization of the Western Hemisphere was actively um, beginning. The pristine myth basically holds that the Western Hemisphere was untouched virgin wilderness, um, that Native Americans were living here, to be sure, but they weren't really impacting their environment in any perceptible ways. This uh, kind of pristine myth then serves as the foundation for various uh, terra nullius arguments about how Native peoples aren't using the land, they're just a natural part of the landscape, and that then justifies uh, European settler colonialism, the seizure of indigenous lands, um, and this whole colonial effort then uh, continues into the present. And so this pristine myth is a really important thing to understand. And Denevin goes to great lengths to unpack this uh, myth, which is exactly um, what it seems to be, uh, that native peoples were not just passive occupants of the Western hemisphere who did nothing to their environments. Uh, they were in fact modifying their environments substantially. Um, they had, uh, in many cases, very perceptible ecological impacts on things um, from plant to animal species to the nature of forest ecology to sedimentology. I mean, all these things that were very um, substantial impacts. And this is what Denimbin outlines in this paper. Uh, of course, this paper inspires a lot of um, debate and conversation after it comes out. And some of this continues into the present. Um, Denovan's kind of argument is that in pre-colonial times, we've got native peoples who are not only impacting the environment, but sometimes having some negative impacts on the environment. Um, they're clearing forests. They are, in some cases, overhunting certain animal species. Um, and then in the early years of the colonial period, we've got um, sort of environmental rebound, right? Recovery, reforestation in some instances could be occurring. These maps from a later paper of Denovan's show this kind of view. These are very uh, speculative approximations based on historical accounts and some archeological evidence. Um, but the idea is basically that there was a lot of deforestation uh, in Denovan's mind prior to Europeans showing up. And that after Europeans arrive, and you've got this early colonial period depopulation of the eastern seaboard here, um, reforestation is occurring. Um, that uh, modified landscape, that anthropogenic landscape of eastern North America recovers in this story. Um, and so when it comes to this idea of pristine wilderness and the idea that maybe that abundance is just natural, it seems unlikely that this is not the case. 
uh, or it seems likely that this is not the case, I should say. But there's still questions um, that remain. Um, we can accept um, from the overwhelming evidence that native peoples were absolutely modifying their landscapes, but there are still questions from certain regions as to just how extensive this modification was, um, what the scale of these changes to the environment would have been, and then, of course, what happens after colonization, um, which largely depends on what the state of the environment was before colonization. And so unpacking these things um, necessitates that we start to understand this concept of environmental rebound, which I've mentioned a couple times now, and I'm going to give you a definition at this point. Um, environmental rebound is basically a return to uh, a state that is characterized by less human impact, right? When an ecosystem shifts from uh, a more anthropogenically modified state to a less modified state or less impacted state. A great example is this photograph here. This is Chernobyl um, from just a couple of years ago. And of course, after the, the kind of nuclear incident that happened at Chernobyl, people left the area. Um, people just moved away and they haven't come back for good reason. And there's been environmental rebound occurring. Um, you can see this is a picture of like a bumper car rink at Chernobyl, where you can see grass moss is growing um, on the cars and over things. Um, the forest is regrowing. There's pictures of animals all over Chernobyl coming back. Um, this is environmental rebound. It's this sort of ecological succession that occurs when plants and animals are recolonizing these previously anthropogenically disturbed areas. And environmental rebound is what um, Denevin is arguing then happened with European colonization. And there's a lot of evidence for this from across the Western hemisphere. Um, this is a chart um, from a 2013 paper on uh, basically charcoal analysis. This is a plot of charcoal influx from various pollen cores from both North and South America averaged all together. And you can see here um, that this red box um, is showing you the time period basically of early European colonization, um, starting around 1500 AD. And beginning around that time, you can see that this charcoal uh, influx really drops off. In fact, it drops to a point lower than any other in the last 6,000 years. Um, and what this means is that prior to Europeans showing up, uh, native peoples seem to have been burning the landscape um, on a very perceptible scale that we can pick this up in all these charcoal records. Uh, but beginning in 1500 AD, Europeans arrive, depopulation occurs from, as I said, epidemics and warfare and genocide and all of these other things. Um, and native population declines. The European population isn't uh, arriving quite in force yet. And so you have this decline in burning um, back to levels unprecedented in, for millennia. Um, and it's relatively brief in the grand scheme of things um, because Europeans start to show up in force. They begin burning the landscape, uh, clearing the land for their own farming. And then the, the charcoal spikes again. And it's a very perceptible pattern, uh, even across southern New England. Um, and so there's a lot of evidence showing this kind of shift from an anthropogenic landscape prior to European colonization to one that is rebounding in various ways uh, in the early years of European colonization. Evidence, as I said, from all over North and South America for this. But what about Southern New England? Um, Southern New England is uh, somewhat different. Um, it's certainly not like uh, Central America or certain areas in South America where you've got just incredible human population density, even areas in kind of Southeastern and Midwest North America. Um, have really high population densities. Southern New England doesn't quite have that, but um, certainly there's still lots of people living here and certainly great potential for this uh, landscape modification that might've been occurring. If we look at the population levels um, of kind of the 17th century in New England, I pulled these numbers from uh, Snow's 1980 book. We can see overall in New England, uh, estimates, of course, are highly variable, and this is just one, but it seems like we're talking somewhere between 150,000, 200,000 people in New England, a little bit less in southern New England itself. And very soon uh, after Europeans start showing up in the 1610s, 1620s, um, the native population declines precipitously, even more than this plot is showing. This is kind of smoothed over. 
Um, and it reaches sort of a low point, the overall human population in Southern New England and New England as a whole, um, between kind of 1640 and 1660 or 70, perhaps. As the native population is declining, um, the European population is growing very rapidly. Um, estimates of the European um, and generally non-native uh, population um, as shown here are showing that the overall human population of this region is really back to its pre-colonial baseline, um, sort of by the early years of the 18th century, by 1700 or 1720 AD. Europeans uh, have shown up in such great numbers that the overall human population is back to where it was before um, the, the kind of negative effects of colonization and the demographic declines of native peoples. And so if we're looking for environmental rebound driven by this demographic decline, as Denovan is talking about, we really need to look in the mid 17th century. That's our best shot for finding this. Once we get into the 18th century, Europeans are modifying the landscape um, to a, a very substantial degree. I mean, huge European numbers, um, huge uh, impacts on the environment in terms of land clearing and burning for their farming. Um, and so it's really the 17th century that we've got to look at for this sort of evidence. Um, and in terms of what's going on then from this shift um, before Europeans show up to the mid 17th century, we can look to ethno-historic accounts to understand what's going on with the environment. Um, we've got Verrazano um, from the 1520s writing when he stayed for I think two weeks in Narragansett Bay um, that uh, there in Narragansett Bay, the fields uh, from the shore extended for 25 to 30 leagues, and they're entirely open and free of any obstacles or trees. Um, he even describes then entering the forests that did exist there, um, more interior, saying that they could be penetrated even by a large army, and then noting the enormous number of animals that were there. And what he means by penetrated even by a large army um, a lot of writers have discussed this, and he seems to be suggesting that the undergrowth, the kind of understory vegetation, really wasn't that abundant, uh, if even it existed at all. The forest was very open, got kind of tall trees, but there's not much in the way of bushes and shrubs on the ground. And so this, in the 1520s, I mean, is a very early record of what's going on. People have argued that this is a first contact encounter. Uh, between uh, Europeans and native peoples. Um, and so this is potentially capturing what the environment of Southern New England was like, at least um, in kind of Western Rhode Island, before all of these impacts of European uh, settlement and of European colonization and uh, whatnot uh, arose in the 17th century. We've then got a really great account from Wood in 1634. And I apologize for the text heavy slide, but I am going to read this to you because it's such a cool account in my opinion. Um, and so Wood was writing in 1634 about things that he had seen in kind of the late twenties and the early thirties. And he says, quote, for it being the custom of the Indians to burn the wood in November when the grass is withered and leaves dried it consumes all the underwood and rubbish, which otherwise would overgrow the country, making it unpassable and spoil their much affected hunting. And so what Wood is saying here that in the autumn when native peoples would burn the forest, um, the objective was to clear out the underwood, as he said, that understory vegetation, the, the shrubs and the bushes and whatnot. It makes it easier to travel through the woods and it makes the hunting better. And this is another theme that is picked up on uh, by a couple different writers from the 17th century, that uh, Native peoples are burning for a couple different reasons, and it makes good sense to do so. Wood then goes on um, and says that in those places where the Indians inhabit, there is scarce a bush or bramble or any cumbersome underwood. Small wood growing in these places where the fire could not come is preserved. In some places where the Indians died of the plague some 14 years ago is much underwood, as in the midway betwixt Wessaguscus and Plymouth, because it hath not been burned. And that right there is the, the fascinating part of this to me. He's describing environmental rebound in action. He says that 14 years ago, right, in that area uh, along the coast of Massachusetts Bay, betwixt Wessaguscus and Plymouth, um, the native inhabitants of that region uh, 
largely died and those that survived probably left and it was depopulated. I mean, we know this from Plymouth itself being kind of an abandoned area. Um, and he says that because they left there, nobody was burning anymore. And that's the only place in the area that he has seen where you've got this understory vegetation because nobody's burning it. That's the environmental rebound in action, right? People have left, people have um, died and the environment is um, changing as a result of that. Nobody's burning. And so the, the understory vegetation is coming back. We've got then evidence potentially for environmental rebound in at least a, a handful of pollen cores from the region. Um, this is one uh, from, this is the Goddard pollen core from Narragansett Bay area. Um, and I got this from Bernstein's 93 book on uh, Greenwich Cove archeological site. And as you can see here, there's um, three zones in this pollen core. You've got this kind of uh, first zone from below 30 centimeters in depth. And there are unfortunately no dates associated with this core, but we can still tell a lot from it regardless. Um, below 30 centimeters in depth, um, the important thing that I would point out is the ambrosia pollen here, right? This is ragweed. Um, ragweed is, I mean, it's a weed. It really thrives in open settings. And so Bernstein's interpretation, um, and he's citing the people who analyzed this pollen core, um, is that in this time period, which seems to be the last years prior to European colonization, there's a lot of ragweed. Uh, it's an open environment, a more open landscape. Then there's a second zone in this pollen core between about 20 and 30 centimeters in depth. As you can see in this ragweed uh, column here, there's hardly any at all. Um, we go from having lots of ragweed pollen to having nearly none. At the same time, uh, certain tree species, look at the Quercus, the oak over here, is spiking. Um, huge numbers of trees, not a lot of ragweed. This is potentially indicative of reforestation, of some sort of environmental rebound occurring, perhaps in the early years of European colonization. Um, then there's a third zone from zero to 20 centimeters in depth, where you can see the ragweed pollen is returning. Um, Quercus really drops off, uh, certain other trees do too. We've got to return then to a more open environment, it seems. So we go from open to closed to open again. Bernstein argues that um, this third zone where we've got the reopening of the landscape, that's driven by Europeans. This is European land clearance in kind of the 18th and 19th centuries, most likely. And he says that based on Plantago here, which is um, an introduced species that is uh, apparently used as an indicator for um, when Europeans show up in various pollen cores. But this middle zone here might be the 17th century. It could be this uh, couple decades of possible reforestation and rebound that's occurring when you've got uh, the trees returning uh, and the landscape sort of closing into these forests. However, that is really kind of the best pollen core that I've seen indicating environmental rebound. Most of them do not seem to indicate rebound. Uh, and this has inspired a big discussion in just the last year, even um, the last few months. Because um, last year, about a year ago, I think it was last winter or spring, um, Oswald et al. published uh, this paper in Nature Sustainability, the top paper here. Um, and it inspired several replies and then replies to the replies going back and forth. Uh, but these authors, Oswald and colleagues, essentially argued that the pollen cores from southern New England do not reveal any perceptible uh, landscape modification by native peoples prior to European colonization, that the only really noticeable impacts to the environment occur after European colonization and are largely driven by that Euro-American land clearance um, that I've mentioned before, for which we've got a lot of evidence after the kind of 18th and 19th centuries. Um, if you look here in the top left, this plot showing charcoal, um, not much fluctuation prior to European colonization, which is this orange bar. And then you see the, the big spikes in charcoal driven by that European, that Euro-American land clearance. Um, similar things with other pollen taxa. These authors argue that um, these pre-colonial changes in pollen abundance uh, are most parsimoniously explained by natural climate environmental variation and are not well explained by uh, native 
actions. Um, they argued that native peoples did not really have any perceptible impact on the environment prior to European colonization. And um, this has inspired a lot of pushback, really. I just have two of the replies up here by Christopher Roos and then Abrams and Nowaki, um, who argue basically that there's potentially methodological problems here. Um, kind of the averaging of the cores is missing some smaller variations that might show that there is landscape modification. I think the perhaps the best argument against this paper is that um, perhaps the land clearance that was going on in southern New England uh, was so localized that it's not being picked up in these pollen cores. Um, people have argued that uh, for Australia as well, where we know that um, there's a lot of uh, burning by Aboriginal Australians, but it's not often picked up in certain pollen cores. And because of the localization of these kind of smaller fires that are regularly set, uh, they're not getting picked up on the broader regional scale. Um, and so there's a lot of questions still remaining about the nature of the environment uh, in the pre-colonial period and even in the colonial period in Southern New England. Um, these authors, uh, Oswald et al, um, certainly acknowledge that native peoples impacted the environment in other parts of North America, they're really just skeptical of it in southern New England. And so there's a lot of work that still remains to be done on this question. Um, and I think that um, pollen cores, for those reasons that I was kind of talking about, maybe they aren't the best evidence for this. Sometimes maybe they're working, sometimes they're maybe not picking up on these changes. And so what I've been doing uh, in the course of my dissertation is using a different proxy for environmental changes, environmental alterations. Uh, and that's the white-tailed deer. Um, I am a zooarchaeologist, and so I study animal bones from archeological contexts. And specifically, my dissertation is aimed at understanding the changing abundance of white-tailed deer in Southern New England. And I think that studying white-tailed deer is actually really useful for answering these questions of environmental shifts uh, across European colonization. Um, when we're talking about white-tailed deer in Eastern North America, right, we are talking about the most important economic food resource for native peoples. Um, it's a, a very large bodied animal compared to most of the other uh, animal prey in Eastern North America. Um, they're very common in archeological sites throughout the Holocene, throughout the last 10 or 11,000 years. Um, you can get a lot of bang for your buck, pun intended, from hunting one of these things. I mean, it's a, it's a good package of meat and they're relatively common, it seems, throughout a lot of time. So this is something that uh, a native hunter would probably always take upon encounter um, if you're out looking for food. Um, it's a really high ranked prey type, we would say. Um, second reason that deer are really important is that they thrive in forest edges um, and they really benefit from ecological disturbance. Deer don't live in closed, dense forests deep in the woods. That's not the habitat they prefer. They prefer the forest edges, those margins of forests and fields. That's where you're more likely to find deer. I mean, any hunters know that now, but if you wanna find deer, you go to these edges. These edge habitats are where deer love, especially the edges of agricultural fields, um, which also would have been an option in, um, the late woodland period prior to European colonization with maize horticulture uh, potentially becoming a very important uh, aspect of the subsistence economy. And so deer, because they love this forest edge habitat, can potentially be a useful indicator um, for the abundance of that type of habitat. If we're talking about um, anthropogenic landscape management, the burning of forests, the creation of these kind of patchwork mosaics of forests and fields of closed and open habitats, um, the more that that's happening, uh, perhaps the more deer we would expect on the landscape at that time. Um, deer are also, interestingly, quite resilient to hunting depression. Um, there's been a lot of theoretical models, there's been a lot of empirical work done that deer populations can actually withstand pretty high predation rates and more or less be doing fine. Uh, it takes a, a pretty strong effort to really start to reduce deer populations through hunting. Um, and so this is an interesting caveat to add into this. So there really are kind of a useful um, kind of indicator taxon, so to speak, um, for studying past habitats. And so uh, I would argue that when you've got abundant deer in archaeological sites, it's possible 
that that is because there was abundant deer habitat. And of course, this is a very kind of simple um, assertion from zoology and biogeography. Um, that we've got a lot of a certain taxon, their habitat probably existed in that time and place. Um, with caveats, of course, as I said, they can be hunted. So it could be that there's lots of prime habitat, but they are being hunted. And so they're not common. There's um, problems with this. But I think as a starting point, it is very useful to think about white-tailed deer as uh, a proxy for this kind of um, patchy edge habitat. Um, that we're most interested in when we're talking about anthropogenic landscape modification. When we turn to the ethnohistoric record from southern New England, um, we've got authors going all the way back to Verrazano who talk about the abundance of deer. I mean, Verrazano says there's enormous number of animals, stags, deer, lynx, other species, right back in the 1520s. Um, Brereton, 1602, talking about an island off of Cape Cod. He says, here also uh, in this island is a great store of deer, which we saw. He says, I saw these huge deer herds on the island. Um, John Smith in 1616, deer, red and fallow, all these and diverse other good things do here for want of use still increase and decrease with little diminution, whereby they grow to that abundance. There's a lot of deer. Um, and of course, somebody saying that there's a lot of deer isn't necessarily the most useful thing, but their perceptions are still interesting, right? And these three accounts are from before kind of the epidemic diseases that we know of, um, these epidemic outbreaks in southern New England happened in kind of 1618, 1619, and then again, 1633 to 1634. Um, after those epidemic outbreaks, we still have people saying there's a lot of deer in southern New England. Um, Wood says it in 1634, but could be recollecting things from the 1620s. Um, Morton in 1637, there's such an abundance of deer that a hundred have been found at the spring of the year within the compass of a mile. And so in the early years of European colonization, people are saying there's a lot of deer. Um, it's possible that this is because of rebound happening after kind of the epidemics. Uh, it's also possible that some of these earlier accounts are picking up on just uh, an abundance of deer um, that have perhaps been promoted by native landscape management, that when native peoples are burning that landscape prior to European colonization, uh, it is in part uh, to promote deer populations or it's inadvertently promoting deer populations if they're doing it to clear land for maize horticulture or something. Um, really great, great quote from uh, Vanderdonk in 1655, writing from New Netherland. Um, and I, again, apologize for the text, but I'm gonna read this quote as well because I think it's so cool. Vanderdonk writes, quote, this is also the Indian hunting season. He's referring to autumn here. Wherein such great numbers of deer are killed that a person who is uninformed of the vast extent of the country would imagine that all these animals would be destroyed in a short time but the country is so extensive and their subsistence so abundant and the hunting being confined mostly to certain districts. Therefore, no diminution of the deer is observable. So he's saying that in 1655, uh, native folks kind of, and of course he's in New Netherlands, so it's kind of out in the Hudson River Valley in the Western Connecticut. Um, he's saying that they're killing so many deer that you would think that the population is gonna crash, but they're not. Uh, there's no indication that the deer population um, is suffering at all, at least in 1655 in this area. Uh, he goes on then to write, the Indians also affirm that before the arrival of the Christians and before the smallpox broke out amongst them, they were 10 times as numerous as they now are, and that their population had been melted down by this disease, whereof nine tenths of them have died. That then before the arrival of the Christians, many more deer were killed than there now are without any perceptible decrease of their numbers. Um, and this is absolutely fascinating to me. Um, Vanderdonk talking to some native folks from this area saying that before Europeans arrived, when the native population was 10 times what it is now following all these epidemics, um, there were an incredible number of deer. More deer were killed than now exist in the area and there was still no decrease in the numbers of the deer. And that's indicative of uh, just a fantastically huge um, population of deer in this region. It seems that before Europeans showed up, there were a lot of deer and they declined at some point in the 1600s, even according to Vanderdonk's record here. Um, 
there's a lot more evidence then um, through kind of the later 17th century and certainly into the 19th century of declining abundance of deer from historic accounts. Uh, in 1646, we have the earliest institution of a closed hunting season on deer from Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Um, from the 1st of May until the 1st of November, if any shall shoot a deer within that time, he shall forfeit five pounds. So there's a fine for killing deer out of season. They're doing this because they're worried the deer population is declining too much. Um, and this kind of then is the earliest account, but by the 18th century, tons of colonial towns have instituted closed deer seasons. Newport, Rhode Island being one of them. In 1705, we've got a record saying it hath been informed that great quantities of deer have been destroyed in this colony out of season and may prove much to the damage of this colony for the future and to the whole country, if not prevented. And so we're seeing people becoming really nervous about declining deer populations really by the 1700s. And that's indicative of um, something very interesting going on with the deer populations. They were seemingly really abundant before Europeans got here um, and became progressively less abundant in the 17th century and definitely into the 18th century. Looking at archaeological evidence, zooarchaeological evidence, we've got some more indications of what might be going on. This is some archaeological data from uh, Martha's Vineyard, from Ritchie's 1969 book on the archaeology of Martha's Vineyard. The top panel here in red is showing the proportion of deer in a series of archaeological sites spanning the woodland period. Um, in orange, I've got kind of the same thing, but I calculated this uh, proportion a little bit differently. I excluded fish just in case it changed the results. It doesn't. Um, both of these proportions um, are showing that in the early woodland period seems to be a good number of deer. And this then declines in the middle woodland period into the early years of the late woodland period. Um, this isn't uh, necessarily a series of results that I would stake my life on, right? There's not that many data points here. We're missing a lot from the middle woodland. Um, and there's pretty large confidence intervals on this, but it's suggestive of a general decline in deer populations through the early and middle woodland. But something different seems to be potentially happening in the late woodland period. Things reverse, and it looks like we have a bit of an increase in the proportion of deer in these sites from Martha's Vineyard. Um, this is very interesting because across the region, the late woodland period is when uh, native populations are kind of peaking. And this is when populations are growing to kind of the highest point yet in a lot of places. And so why then would you have human populations growing and deer populations growing right alongside them if deer are being preyed upon by humans? Conventionally, you would expect that as human populations go up, deer populations go down. But that's the opposite of what's happening here. They're both going up. This could be due to uh, indigenous ecosystem engineering. This is potentially landscape management, that when you're creating that sort of forest edge habitat that the deer really like, you can promote deer populations. The deer populations will thrive under these conditions, even if you are preying upon them potentially quite heavily. Um, if you're creating enough habitat that they like, the population could still be doing fine. Um, the bottom panel here, I also want to talk about, this is showing richness, taxonomic uh, richness. Richness basically just means the number of different species. And the general assumption when you're studying kind of subsistence and foraging and this sort of thing is that deer, as I said, are kind of the highest ranked resource that you could go after. They're your priority. They're the most efficient resource available to you based on a lot of experimental and ethnographic calculations that we can come up with. If there's a lot of deer on the landscape, you can get by hunting just deer. If there aren't a lot of deer, you need to broaden your diet. You need to expand out, diversify a bit and start taking other prey species. And so richness should go up when deer populations um, go down, right? If you've got fewer deer on the landscape, you broaden your diet. What we're seeing in this richness measure here, again, very wide confidence intervals. I'm not staking my life on this, but it's suggestive. Um, in the early woodland period through to the beginning of the late woodland period, it looks like there's a bit of an increase in richness. A little blip in the middle woodland kind of dips down a bit. Confidence intervals are big though. It seems like a general upward trend. And then in the late woodland period, a downward trend. Again, largely driven by one or two data points. It's not the most clear, 
but it's consistent with what's going on with the abundance of deer from the same sites that as the deer uh, abundance goes up, richness goes down. This, this jives with what we think um, could potentially be happening here. That people um, in the late woodland period, there's more deer to go after. And so you don't need to diversify your diet as much and you can zero in on the deer. Um, similar data from the Connecticut River Valley from uh, Kevin McBride's dissertation. In these sites, the faunal assemblages are definitely not good enough to calculate proportions or anything like that, or to do many sophisticated analyses, but we can look at richness overall, which I've got all the way down here at the bottom. Generally, from the late archaic through the late woodland, between four to eight different species um, are taken in these different time periods based on a bunch of sites that Kevin reports. Things change, however, in the 17th century. All of a sudden, in 17th century sites, 13 different species, or 13 different taxa, are uh, being identified. This is potentially the diversification of diets. This is potentially the broadening of diet breadth driven by that decline in deer abundance, that if there aren't that many deer on the landscape, you're not able to get your prime uh, prey species, you got to broaden your diet. You go after more things, in this case, potentially 13 different taxonomic groups. Um, and so this is kind of consistent with this broader story that you've got potentially uh, good numbers of deer in the pre-colonial period, but the deer population starts to decline in the 17th century. Uh, and then finally, some data from uh, Vasta's dissertation on the Mashantucket Pequot Reservation, specifically the Monhantic Fort site, um, which is from 1675 and 76. And then Bernstein's book from 93 on the Greenwich Cove site uh, on the kind of western shores of Narragansett Bay. Again, always with a grain of salt, right? These are two different sites in two different areas. They're close somewhat geographically, but not that close. Um, but generally what we're seeing here is that in the late woodland at the Greenwich Cove site, a higher proportion of deer in that assemblage than we're seeing at the Monhantic Fort site from the 1670s. Deer population seems to be declining in the 17th century. Um, is consistent with the other zoarchaeological kind of evidence that we've got. It's consistent with ethnohistoric records as far as we can tell. Um, it looks like there is a general pattern of abundant deer prior to European colonization. And in the 17th century, deer populations are declining. Um, the explanations for this, right? The first of these would be this sort of reforestation that's happening. Um, uncritically applying this concept of environmental rebound, one might think that deer populations should be increasing at this time. Um, and certain other people in other parts of North America have observed this and argued it. But in Southern New England, uh, something different seems to be happening. It's not that deer were overhunted prior to European colonization and then rebounded in the early years of European colonization. It's that deer were actually doing fine prior to European colonization. And the possible reforestation and habitat loss um, incurred by deer in the 17th century is what then um, perhaps uh, that reforestation is what's driving this potential decline in deer abundance. This is just one possible explanation, however. Um, I think it's a very interesting one, but more work needs to be done on it to tie these kind of habitat changes to deer abundance. Um, another possible explanation is uh, basically the commodification of deer in these kind of early European capitalist economies. We've got the fur trade, we've got other um, economic things going on at this time. It's possible that there could be increased pressure to hunt deer starting in the 17th century, and that's what's driving this decline in deer. Um, the deer skin trade is something that a lot of people have paid quite a bit of attention to. Um, and it's especially interesting because um, as far as I have been able to uh, tell, the deerskin trade is really predominantly a Southeastern phenomenon and kind of an 18th century phenomenon. It certainly starts in the 17th century. It's certainly um, people are taking deer pelts all up and down uh, the East Coast. But the, the in most intense deerskin trade was going on in the Carolinas and Tennessee and Virginia and places like that. In New England, 
um, there's just not as much evidence as there is in the Southeast for deer skin being uh, a really integral part of the fur trade. Um, very, there are tons of early ethnohistoric accounts of um, pelts being exchanged between native peoples and European peoples of the kind of prime species that you would target if you're trying to make money selling the pelts. Deer are very rarely listed um, by these early writers in such lists. Um, one of the clearest accounts in this kind of genre um, by Morton in 1637, he wrote that native hunters will quote, give for one deer hide killed in season, two, three, or four beaver skins, which will yield pounds apiece in that country. So much is the deer's hide prized with them above the beaver. And this is uh, an especially interesting quote because it's showing, first of all, that um, these European fur traders are really targeting beaver in New England. Um, it's really all about the beaver when we're talking New England fur trade. Um, a lot of other animals are mentioned. You've got fox and wild cats and uh, you know, otters and things. Um, but beaver is the prime thing. And of course, then the wampum stuff that's going alongside that aspect of the fur trade. And so they're trying to get beaver skins from native hunters. And in some cases, according to Morton, I mean, they're giving deer hides to native peoples in exchange for two, three, or four beaver skins. Um, and so native folks are willingly trading those beaver skins away to get the deer pelts. That's what they really want. And of course, native peoples are making a lot of clothing and blankets and things out of deer hide. Um, and the beaver is being used to make kind of nice felt hats like this in the 17th century uh, of Europe. And so it doesn't seem to me that um, deer are a huge part of the fur trade and the deerskin trade going on in New England. It does seem to be more Southeastern focused in my opinion, but that's not to say that it's not happening and it wasn't a contributing factor and that it wasn't something important going on. And of course, there's other reasons to be hunting deer um, beyond just kind of simple subsistence to feed yourself and your family and your village or whatever. Um, certainly with um, livestock not being that common in the early years and kind of the difficulties of herd management. Oftentimes wild game is a really great source of meat protein that you're going to prioritize over slaughtering your own animals if you can get it. And so certainly people are buying and selling venison all over the place in New England. This could be something that's driving that 17th century and later declines in white-tailed deer in the region that we seem to be observing. Um, and so to kind of summarize and interpret all of this data, um, deer appear to have been relatively abundant in pre-colonial times. Um, and they began to decline in abundance sometime in the 17th century. And this continued into the 18th and 19th centuries by the point where, I mean, Thoreau white writing in the mid 1800s describes how there's just no deer left in the woods in New England. Um, they're all gone. This could be due to the termination of indigenous ecosystem engineering. It could be that native peoples were managing the landscape, promoting deer populations, and that with colonization, they couldn't do that anymore. Um, and deer populations declined alongside native peoples because there was a bit of a sort of mutualistic relationship going on there. It's also possible that this is an economic force in the 17th century, that the integration of native peoples and the integration of the Western hemisphere into this kind of nascent global capitalist economy um, is putting more pressure on deer populations. And that's what's driving the decline. It could also be both of these things. Um, my dissertation is really focusing on differentiating these. Um, and I don't have the results finalized yet, so I can't tell you um, which one of these is perhaps most likely. It could be both. Um, and I am going to skip over for the sake of time a uh, discussion of how we can tell the difference between these explanations and to kind of get towards the end of my talk. Um, I want to talk about what all of this really means and why it's relevant today. Um, and uh, kind of potentially some implications of it for the present and the future. What I think we're seeing here, um, if these patterns all hold, and again, this is all still um, a bit up in the air, right? So this, as I said, I'm not staking my life on any of these results. This just seems to be the, the picture of what I'm seeing at the moment. It seems that prior to European colonization, um, we've got a, a rather much more sustainable economic system going on. Um, Native peoples are 
certainly hunting deer have been for millennia, right? But the deer populations were doing fine, it seems. We don't really have clear evidence of over-exploitation of deer in Southern New England. Um, and so this was a more sustainable situation in many ways. In the 17th century, the 18th century, and so on, things are different, right? We don't have um, necessarily uh, the same level of sustainability when it comes to the economics of subsistence practices here. Deer populations survived intact for thousands of years under native hunting pressures, but within a couple decades after Europeans showed up, they're locally extirpated in a lot of cases. Um, that's something very different going on here um, and something that is uh, much more complex and really driven by, I think, in some ways, all sorts of global economic forces, even. Um, I mean, it's, it's not that simply population went up in the 17th century and deer populations declined. Population went down in the 17th century and deer populations declined. And so that's a really interesting phenomenon that speaks to some broader economic and social and political patterns that are happening at this time. Um, I do think that there's actually some policy implications here, some lessons that we can learn. Um, of course, as we're all aware, we're faced with um, unprecedented climate change. Um, anthropogenic impacts on our global climate um, are leading to a really severe existential threat um, in the coming years. This is uh, a situation that is rather dire and people have really begun to take seriously some policy proposals to counter this. One of the suites of policy proposals that have been proposed is that we need to transition to what's being called a regenerative economy. Um, policymakers and lawmakers and uh, activists and academics are all trying to identify um, ways that we can transition our society to be more sustainable and more regenerative, in a sense. Um, when we're talking about regenerative economics, um, we're talking about a very different worldview, very different views of labor and resource use, um, even politics. Under a regenerative economy, um, the objective is to really get to a place where our socioeconomic system is a little bit more um, caring and cooperative, um, uh, more strongly democratic, with more public uh, involvement and access to things, less inequality, more ecological and social well being, and kind of sustainable resource use. That's the objective that policymakers have been trying to get to. Um, what we're currently living under. Uh, is what people are terming an extractive economy. Um, very consumer driven and outgrowth of the last 500 years of colonization, very colonialist, um, where there's exploitation of natural resources, of nature and the environment. There's exploitation of workers. Um, there's exploitation of people at all levels in society, high levels of inequality, um, all sorts of really negative things. And this extractive economic system is what's driving largely um, all of the negative things that we're seeing in the world, uh, specifically with uh, relation to climate change. And the fascinating part about this shift that policymakers are currently proposing is that really the extractive economy that we currently have is the result of the last 500 years of European colonization that the settler colonialism that we're talking about in Southern New England was kind of one of the early attempts to integrate the world into this early capitalist framework of extraction of resources um, and of exploitation in a lot of ways. And so colonization is in many ways, this sort of shift from a regenerative economy to an extractive economy in the context that we're talking about it here. Um, and this is not to kind of anachronistically apply a concept like regenerative economics to indigenous um, societies before European colonization, but I do believe that a lot of indigenous groups um, certainly had aspects of their societies, their political systems, um, their economic systems that would uh, better qualify as regenerative um, than a lot of alternatives. And so in many ways we can think of a lot of these indigenous um, economic structures as more regenerative than what we're dealing with. And colonization was a shift from that to extractivism, to this really um, unfortunate system that has led us to the predicament we're now in. What policymakers are then doing in proposing that we 
go from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy is in part doing something new, right? But in a sense, it's also the sort of decolonial effort um, that there's many ways that we can learn from the past, learn from other societies and other cultures about what alternatives to extractive economics and undemocratic systems might look like. Um, so that we don't need to purely imagine those alternatives out of thin air, that we can look to these actual case studies um, and study regenerative economics in action in the past and even in the present in kind of societies and groups that are outside the influence of this, if there are any. Um, and so this, I think, is actually a really useful um, way in which to approach a lot of archeological and anthropological work. It's something that I kind of have in mind when I'm working on these types of issues. Um, understanding that the work that we do as archaeologists can have contemporary policy implications. Um, if we put it into conversation with uh, things that people are discussing today and the solutions that people are proposing, we can learn a lot from indigenous peoples in southern New England, from indigenous peoples all over the world, and from uh, essentially a whole variety of other cultures um, and societies that uh, have persisted or in some cases haven't. Um, and that's a really useful thing for archaeologists to be able to do. Um, and so that's uh, what I've got for you. Um, if anybody has any questions that they don't want to ask now, you can always email me or find me on Twitter. Um, but otherwise, I'm happy to take some questions now. Great. Thanks, Alec. Um, I think there's a couple in the Q&A uh, already, so I'll give you a chance to look at those. Um, mm -hmm. I had uh, one question, though. I wonder. Um, when you were uh, showing your graphs with uh, the species richness and the proportion of deer and the proportion of deer with no fish, um, I wonder just what your thoughts are in the late woodland period when there are uh, non-vertebrate food sources that are more reliable, like maize, squash, you know, th those types of um, horticulture food resources, how that changes um, some of the uh, behavioral ecological pressures that people are under uh, for, you know, their, their hunting and, and gathering. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a fantastic issue to raise. Um, and this is kind of uh, something that's always at the heart of a lot of these uh, kind of foraging theory studies of things, um, that there's often certain resources like deer, which, as I said, are high ranking to use the kind of parlance of optimal foraging theory and behavioral ecology. Um, because they're economically high utility, that um, the calories per unit hour, that num people have crunched the numbers, and it, it works out to be that they are the highest ranked species. But as you're saying, there are a lot of other species out there that um, perhaps aren't as high ranking in the same way, but could be more reliable. Um, certainly when you're getting into horticulture, that's a thing. Um, talking about shellfish, even, shellfish is a really reliable food resource. Um, in terms of calories per hour, much lower than deer, but it's reliable. And deer can be a bit more unpredictable in ways. And so when we're talking about these kind of shifts in the late woodland period with the introduction of possibly maize horticulture and other shifts in subsistence, um, it's entirely possible that the changes in richness that I'm seeing, the changes in uh, other aspects of the subsistence economy could be driven by these alternatives. Um, I'm just proposing one option now, but yeah, it's entirely possible that there's other things going on. And that's something that, um, something that I wanna look more into because there has been some work on uh, kind of the cost benefit analyses of maize horticulture in other regions. And so we do have kind of numbers to be able to put into conversation and compare these different resources. Um, it's not something I've gotten to yet, but yeah, you're absolutely right that there could be um, alternatives going on there. Cool. Um, so if other people have questions, uh, you can put them in the Q&A. I see that there's a uh, paper that somebody put in there, Alec. Or maybe you, if you've read that, you could comment on it. Um, also, if you want to ask a question uh, audibly, you can do the raise your hand feature, I think. Uh, or you can just type in the Q&A that you want to ask a question, and I can activate your mic, too. Any other questions? Well, I've got another one. Um, so I wonder, uh, going back to the um, the nature communications papers uh, on uh, the burning mm -hmm. uh, in the late woodland period, uh, 
I wonder what your thoughts are about, I mean, a lot of those are very specific to, um, as you said, very specific environmental contexts of kettle ponds and, and those types of pollen core locations. Uh, and maybe looking at other types of indicators, uh, some possibly through white-tailed deer like you're talking about, but also maybe more regional indicators of pollen. Uh, you know, pollen cores can be had from rivers too. I know that people who study pollen don't like them as much because it is a more regional signature, but it seems to me that a more regional signature might be more valuable in some of these contexts as opposed to a tight ecological signature too. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, the, so if you look at the, the Oswald paper from 2020 in uh, Nature Sustainability, the, the map of all the pollen core sites that they looked at, it's a huge number of pollen core sites um, from these kind of smaller ponds and uh, things that you're mentioning. And it's also really heavily focused on coastal areas and specifically kind of Cape Cod and that sort of area. There's only a handful of pollen cores from interior locations. Um, and I think only even one from the Connecticut River Valley that they included. And so that's kind of uh, in addition to what you're raising about other types of regional indicators, I would also be really interested in um, expanding and getting some more pollen cores from these more interior locations. Because I mean, archaeologists in New England have long discussed these differences between what's going on in the coast, what's going on in interior river valleys, in the uplands and in interior areas. Um, there's a whole bunch of different things that could potentially be going on there. And so I would love to see more pollen analyses going on that could be able to pick up on that kind of thing in other settings. Um, I would also absolutely love alternatives to pollen analyses. I mean, uh, phytoliths would be one option for this. I mean, you can do all sorts of really cool environmental reconstructions from phytoliths um, yeah. where you can look at kind of open and closed taxa and try to figure out what's going on with that. Um, and, there's and other I'm folks. I'm wondering if there's any sort of wood analyses that you could see stress in the trees from burning too, um, but I don't know. Uh, but I, I noticed that Ernie had a question too. So Excellent. Uh, Ernie, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I seem to recall that uh, Richie's work on uh, Martha's Vineyard indicated that there was a preponderance of male deer uh, in the middens, uh, that there seemed to be uh, predation was specializing in males, which to me always made sense on an island environment. But given what you were saying about the super abundance of deer in pre-contact times, could it be that... Um, that uh, Native Americans began shifting to a pattern of uh, concentrating on male deer uh, after or during or after contact, or could this uh, pattern ex explain part of the abundance in pre-contact times? I don't know if anyone's ever done a study, especially for the mainland, uh, whether that kind of uh, focus on the males may have been, may have been done. That's very interesting. Yeah, I don't recall that observation from Richie's book, but it's been a while since I read it. Um, that is, would be really interesting to look at because, I mean, uh, preserving, of course, the kind of female population would be a, an, an action that could promote the sustainable harvest of deer yeah. into the future. And so that would be a really interesting analysis to kind of look at. The, I'm not aware of anybody who's looked at kind of the, the sex differences and the ratios of deer bones from the mainland. And I'm trying to think about the feasibility of it. Richie's, I mean, the sites that Richie looked at had huge faunal assemblages um, that are leaps and bounds beyond a lot of the stuff that I'm seeing from the mainland. Um, but there's a lot of cool techniques now, even um, using ancient DNA, where you can kind of extract DNA from deer bones and sex those individuals. And looking at that could be very interesting. That's a really good point, Ernie. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I like that. I'm going to keep that in mind for the future. Yeah, and so uh, I guess the raise hand feature isn't working. So just do what uh, Don and Ernie did, uh, ask to be promoted to panelist in the uh, Q&A, and I can do that. Uh, but Craig has a question, too. So you can see it there. Yes, looks like we've got a number of cores taken around Robin Swamp. Information is at the... IAIS. Excellent. That's good to know. Thank you, Craig. Uh, 
Uh, let's see. Are there any other questions? Well, uh, if there are no other questions, uh, I'd just like to thank you, Alec, uh, for giving us this presentation. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody else did too. Um, otherwise, join us again next Wednesday uh, for our second lecture. I think it will be Kevin McBride, uh, who's going to be talking about uh, the Pequot War. Um, so please join us next Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And thanks again, Alec. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everybody else, for coming.